<laughs> That's so funny. It's like, hey, I quit. Cool. Will you show me houses? I don't why he told me he was looking into that kind of thing. So I specifically left that job on the terms. So Good. Possibly. Yeah. <laughs> Good. All right. Well, we are. We've gone through a lot. I don't know if you guys have done all of these Austin area. You done all of these? You might have been through most of them. I have a little poster where you should check off what you've done. It used to be in the back there, and it disappeared. No one knows about it. Luckily, I have a second one. I'm trying to figure out where do I put it so it doesn't disappear. Um, but so we just went through when the buyer, with the seller, which is the the idea of like the appointment and getting them into your pipeline and you're like, yes, you are working with me, I'm working with you. The whole goal in those is to get them to sign an agreement with you. Once you have the agreement signed, that's where we are today, working with the buyers and sellers. Um, and then so in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna do make and receive offers, which is a good one, negotiating, getting to the close, and then plan your future. So we have a lot of good ones coming up of more like, in the weeds actually working with it. I like these a lot because a lot of people tend to struggle with this first part, the generating the leads, if you don't know the second part. It's kind of scary to be like, yeah, let's go call my friend. And when they're like, sure, I want to make an offer. It's like, I don't even know what to do with all of this. So it's a good one. Uh, but I would say lead generation is always the most important. Get the best at that. If you get good at this, it might do some of the lead generation with reviews and referrals. So here's kind of our, our schedule today. Talking about success with clients, with buyers, with sellers, with agents, and then kind of a quick little recap. Virtually every top producing agent we have ever worked with has a deep and almost inherent sense of service. They have a servant's heart and a place and place their buyer's or seller's real estate experience above all else. They're always thinking of service. Um, have you guys ever had a great experience with service somewhere in the world? I'm a part of a church that does service all the time. So I just had a meeting yesterday where the entire hour session was talking about things that we could do to serve people and service-oriented things. Love it. Love it. So what does that entail when you do service? Putting your own needs over, or putting someone else's needs over your own, which prioritizes a little bit over yes. what you want to do. You kind of do things you don't want to do in order to help somebody else. Every year, my neighborhood does this neighborhood cleanup, and my yard is the worst on my street. I have five kids. We have a bunch of sports. I'm always doing stuff as well. Like, we have a hard time just keeping up on mowing the lawn, right? Tonight, three of my children have some sort of practice for sport, and so, like, today's gone. <laughs> Tomorrow, there's two games and a practice. Wednesday, we have five practices for four children that are in sports. Thursday, similar, like we just have a crazy life. So for me to do yard work is almost impossible. Every year we do a, a neighborhood cleanup and I end up waking up early to mow my front lawn so that it looks like I don't need the help. And then I am out at other people's houses doing yard work when I could probably use more yard work. So yeah, that one hits home. Like you were putting others before you, but what happens when you do that? You tend to get the best results. Zig Ziglar says to get what you want, help enough people get what they want. And so if what you want from real estate is money, income, the ability to go find rental properties, hit your goals, your big why, whatever that is, help people get what they want and you'll get what you want. So let's talk about um, working with clients. There is 
so many things that you could do to be a good agent. I was talking to one of my friends one time and he said, yeah, the agent that got this house for me, uh, they call him the bulldog because he was just like, he like negotiates better than anyone else. And I love that. I'm like, okay, that's interesting. Um, talk to other people that are like, oh, they were so helpful and answered all of my questions. They were always there when I needed it. They found us such a good deal. Like there's all of these things that you could do. If you do one thing better than any other agent, I want it to be communication. You will never have someone say, I hated the, the experience with my agent because they were a good communicator. <laughs> they will often say that they're bad communicators. Years and years ago, the biggest um, complaint sellers had was they had no idea what their agent was doing. So we'll kind of go through the steps of the transaction in a minute, but when you list a house, there's a lot that goes on right up front, right? You're like, you meet with them, you get the agreement signed, you're like, okay, we're gonna do photos in a couple of days. So you guys need to clean up, you need to do all of these things. You need to get the carpet cleaned, you need to, take down these things you need to paint that wall and you like lay out all these things and then you're checking in hey did all that get done the photographer is ready to come out the photographer comes out and then you go live and you're going about going live and then you have the open house and you're planning that and after the open house it kind of goes like silent because you're not really doing anything like you're still doing things like you'll build some calls you'll check out stats you'll announce it in team meeting, but there's all of these things that you just kind of are doing in the background and the sellers are like, they're not doing anything. After the open house, I haven't heard from them in weeks and weeks and weeks. And so one of the things is I always say, you should talk to every single client you have every single week. And when I say client, I mean signed agreement. If you have a signed agreement, you should have communication with them every week. I default to a phone call. When they don't answer, I send a text message. You, this is true for buyers and sellers, right? And so number one, it provides a strong foundation for a relationship. I would argue that the goal of having a client is not helping them buy or sell a house, but helping them buy or sell a house in such a way that they give you referrals. Is that yours? Yes. <laughs> um, so if you have a strong relationship, you're getting referrals. Like imagine like, how hard it is to find one client. Now, imagine a world where every time you have a client, they refer you to at least one other person that closes the house. So you walk from transaction to transaction, not even worrying about lead generation because the person that you worked with had such a good experience making referrals. Um, setting and managing expectations proactively throughout the transaction. Proactively is a big piece here. I would say every time you talk to someone, you tell them what is happening next. You give them a quick little update, tell them what's happening next. Even if that is, we are waiting on people, right? Uh, give them peace of mind and enhances your credibility. So there's three levels of services KW defines them. There's the purpose level of service, there's the value proposition, and there's the fiduciary. The purpose is usually what people are thinking when they hire a real estate agent, right? The purpose of a real estate agent is to sell my house for the most amount of money, help me find the house, whatever that is. That is like the baseline that we can judge ourselves on. So if you close a house, you finish that, that purpose. You have done what they hired you to do. You've sold them a house. Now, the second level of service is your value proposition. This is the reason that they should pay you more money than the next agent. Because if you just sell them a house, there are a lot of people that sell houses. There are discount brokerages that sell houses, right? Like Homey was probably the biggest, but there are a bunch like that, that they will put your home on the MLS for a flat fee, $1,000 or less. And then you get the photos, you put up a sign, you do all the marketing, you do everything, but they've put it on the MLS for you. So if your purpose to sell a house is just sell a house, there's a cheaper way to do it. 
The value proposition is how you are going to do that better and why they should pay you above that. And then the third is the fiduciary, right? So what's a, oh, I love this formatting. What's the difference between functionary and fiduciary? Uh, fiduciary isn't functional because sometimes you have to like, there's like certain things you, like this, this disclosure means like you can't disclose certain things mm -hmm. versus functional is purpose, like it's to get the thing done. Yep, yeah. yep, get the thing done. Uh, one of the examples I always give on this is I have a friend uh, when I first got into the business, he's like, I want to sell my house. I have so many friends in real estate. Like, I don't know who to choose. And I was like, <clears throat> like, look, man, why don't you just interview all of your good friends that are in real estate and then just pick whoever does the best job. I'll go first. <laughs> I got my agreements when I left with him. But one of the things that I said to him is as I walked through, I was like, I was like, I don't mean this rude, but why did you buy this house? He's like, what do you mean? And I was like, I was like, well, you said you bought it once you had one kid. Corbin, come on in. He's like, you bought this house when you had one kid. You want to have three or four children. It has two bedrooms. Like when you moved in, you knew you had maybe a two or three life year lifespan, and then you had to move. I would have said, let's buy something with at least three rooms or the ability to go add some more bedrooms or something. They didn't have a basement in it. It was just a townhome that went straight up. So I was like, I would not let you buy this house if we were to go back in time. And that was me being the fiduciary. I often go into listing appointments and say, hey, could you keep this as a rental? Do you know how much money I make when I convince someone to keep it as a rental? Zero dollars. Why do I try to do it? Because it is the best way to build wealth. If you keep a rental property on average, commission the four, or not commission, <laughs> look at me thinking about money and myself. Uh, appreciation goes up 4% every year. So that means you buy a house for $500,000 today. I should have done easier math than this. Uh, next year is $520,000. So you made $20,000 because you own a home. It goes up typically 3% every single year or ha and has since like the 80s. So every year you get a 3% raise for your house and you get a 4% like this pile of money. Plus you're paying, the, your renters actually pay down your mortgage. So for that is your principal gets paid down. And then um, you get tax benefits. You get to write off that interest. You get to depreciate that asset. Like there's so many benefits to owning a rental that it makes sense to keep every house that you ever own. Like if I could give one piece of advice to people is never sell a house, always figure out how to buy your house, your next house without selling your current house. Because if you were able to rent every single house you ever lived in, when you retire, there's so many ways that you can use those to your benefits. So you are the fiduciary. You are not functionary. The functionary checks the boxes. The fiduciary actually does the best thing for their clients. Uh, great example, Corbin just sold a house and it was a rental, but was that the best thing for them? That was like for what they needed, it was, but they were too scared and they, just, they needed out. They needed out. It is the best thing and they didn't want it. So he helped them sell their house. And now they're free and clear of it. They don't have to worry about it anymore. It was probably just like a load of stress off of them, even though it's probably better for them to keep owning the house. Okay. Um, dual agency. Do you guys know what this is? This is when we represent both the buyer and the seller. We do not do that at our brokerage um, because you can't be the fiduciary for both sides. You, you run into this weird thing. So um, if you ever run into this, it is very easy. Like, let's say you represent a seller and you're at the open house and an unrepresented buyer comes in and they're like, I want to buy it. You have two options to help them out. Number one, they come in unrepresented, meaning they do not have an agent. You will walk them through the transaction, but you will be the functionary for them and you will not be their agent. So when you're negotiating for them, you are getting the best for your sellers, not for them. 
if they decide you want an agent and they're like, can I just hire you? You can say, let me actually set you up with an agent at my brokerage. They could be in your best interest because I'm in the seller's best interest. And then you call someone like you could call someone in this room and be like, hey, Austin, I got a buyer. Will you represent them? By the way, give me a 50% referral fee. Do you know what Austin's going to say? What do I need to do? Write up an offer? 100% I'm in. Like that is just gifted money and I will happily pay you 50%. By the way, typical it's 25% uh, as a referral fee. But if I'm setting everything up and it's like, you write this offer, I'm, I would ask for more. So don't do uh, don't do um, dual agency, but those are the two ways out. Yeah. Can I you act as certified for the buyer and say it might be somewhere for you? I'm starting to in but I can't represent you. Um, so charge them, then you have to be their agent because you need an agreement signed on how they're paying you, and that is considered representation. So, so basically just tell them what things you need. Yep. Can I work with the seller then and say, hey, I've got this, this yep. buyer. It's so cost me time and yep. effort. So you pay me. So how, pay how I structure all of my listing agreements is I say, um, I, I add an addendum to it. So I say, hey, I'm 3%. What would you like to offer the buyer's agent? I suggest 3% because most buyers are going to ask for that. Now that is negotiable, right? My fee is negotiable as well, but I don't, I don't offer that up to them. I just say I'm three percent, and then what do you want to offer them? That's negotiable. I suggest three. Let's put three here. I'm not going to tell anyone about three, but if they're offer, if they want three, then we have it all already worked out. Then I add an addendum and I say, now there's a couple things that could happen. Number one is if sometimes people are like, well, what if my neighbor wants to buy my house? Like, you know, if your neighbor buys your house, then I'm not going to represent you and charge you a full 3% because you're doing all of that work. I'm just going to charge you 1%. So let's write down your neighbor's name. If John Smith ends up buying the house, then I'm going to charge 1%. Then the other thing is if we have an unrepresented buyer, my marketing brings people in that do not have an agent. I am going to help that agent or that buyer walk through it without an agent other than this 3% that we pay a buyer's agent, I'm going to increase my listing agent commission to 4% or 4.5%. That's pretty common. Um, I like to do 4% because then I just get more money for doing a little bit more work. Um, and so then I'll just say 4% for, for that. And then I feel like there's one more that I like to put. That's usually all I put, I think. Yeah. So you could have like tiers. Uh, there's agents sometimes that will that will do different levels, right? Like uh, pick your plan, small, medium, large type of an idea. And the, so if someone's like, do you negotiate your commission? You're like, oh, definitely. I already have that worked out. So it's like, if you want to pay me 4%, I will hire movers. I will replace your car. I will do all of these things for you. I will pay for cleaners. I will pay for state. I will pay for all of this. That's 4%. 3% what everyone is getting the best service, everything like that. Um, you should hire a, buyer, a buyer's agent. So if you're not paying a buyer's agent, then we can go all the way down to 1% if you bring me the buyer. So it's like you can kind of negotiate against them by the end. Oh, I already worked this out. You can pay me more, you can pay me less, but it's depending on what you do. Um, okay, wait, but before we dive too in too much more into ex setting expectations, what questions do you have about working with buyers and sellers? Like you get the agreement signed all the way down to like getting it under contract. What questions or worries do you guys have? Um, I guess to give you an example, because like with our my deal, there were situations where like we had we had it written and, and something changed right after we both signed and agreed, the ref C. But, but um, how like I we 
overlook other aspects that were written, I guess, into the rep seat after that, because mm. we were focused on like a specific aspect of it. So then, then we had to like write an addendum later to add Just one to kind extra of... thing because we forgot to add it from the original, like re add it because we were so focused on. Can you do it three times? Basically two times, but it was just like addendum. But that that extra stuff was like not like uh it, it wasn't like the sellers um like they weren't adding anything like they were paying an extra amount of money. It was kind of like like the washer and dryer like we were supposed to add that wasn't added in the second rep C. Mm. But that whole situation was weird too. So. Yeah, I was gonna say, in fairness, you had the most complicated offer of the yeah. year so far. It was yeah. it was all over the place. <laughs> yeah, especially for the amount of commission that I did it for too. Was... Yes. Yeah. So I want to give some advice right now based off of that concept. Um, people will often ask you for a discount for certain things, family and friends, things like that. They're like, will you give me a discount? I do not give discounts because I give better level of service. Legit, this is this is a story that, that hurts me still. But my father asked me for a discounted commission to sell his house. Do you know what I told him? No, this is how I feed your grandchildren. <laughs> so... Every once in a while, you'll get someone that will ask you for a discount or it seems to make sense to give them a discount. Those people, those deals usually are harder than the ones that you get the full commission. It's like if you sell like a little $300,000 condo, you will probably going to work harder than if you sold a million dollar listing. Now, it's not always true, but typically it's like that. So, yeah. Don't discount. Yeah. Um, setting expectations. This is probably the most important thing. When do you set expectations for your buyers or sellers? You start. No. Like right as you sign the contract. Yep. Signing the contract. What else? Initial contract. Initial contract. What else? Probably when the whole like, time. I guess the whole time. Yeah. The whole time. I was going to say yes to every single answer that you guys said because that is what it is, right? From your first phone call, hey, we should meet up in my office to make a game plan to get you out looking for houses. Can you come by Thursday at six? Great. I just set an expectation in that it was even a little bit of a sell. Like we're going to make a game plan. So when they walk in, what are they expecting? They're going to have a game plan because that's how I pitched it. That was the expectation. Now I did it in a salesy way, uh, but that was kind of how I closed people. Let's sit down in my office and make a game plan. That is an expectation. It should take about 30 minutes. That is an expectation. Um, you will leave with a signed agreement that I'll be your agent. You can set that expectation right up front. You can say all of those things. When you are in the appointment, you are going to tell them about the process and you are going to set them expectations, right? When we, we write an offer, we are going to have to give earnest money. The lowest I've ever seen this is about $1,000 in this market. Typically, it's more like half a percent to 1% of whatever we are offering. So you're going to have to have some amount of money to put down as soon as we write the offer. An inspection is going to be about $500. The appraisal is going to be about $500, $700. I actually don't know what that is anymore. Maybe $750. When you close, you're going to have to have the rest of your down payment. It's going to be your earnest money plus your, the rest of your down payment that the lender says. You will need to get approved by a lender. You will need to talk to people on the phone during this process. Whatever those expectations are that you want to set, you should be communicating with them. Then every time you talk to them in the future, you should set expectations for what is happening next, right? Hey, we're going to go see three houses today. If you like one of those three houses, we will write an offer 
If we get scared and need to back out, that is completely fine. We have a lot of things worked into it, but if we look at these houses, we're gonna write an offer. If we don't like any of these houses, I need your feedback to know which houses that we should go see and why you didn't like this offer or these, these houses. Very real to set expectation like that for buyers. So let's talk real quick about the whole process that you should go. So number one, partner with an agent, right? This is kind of all of the Ignite classes that have led up to here, which is you should have, you generate leads, you go on appointments and you get them to sign the agreement. This is from sign the agreement on. Uh, get pre-approved for a loan. This may happen and probably should happen before the buyer's appointment. I think it should always happen before a buyer's appointment because what happens if the lender says, He's got awful credit. Then you don't work with them. They're not ready yet. They have zero down for a, a down payment and they want a million dollar home. What if they think that they're going to be approved for a $700,000 house? Find out they're only approved for $400,000. That changes things a whole lot. So getting pre-approved for a loan is usually the first step before even partnering with an agent. But you're going to... Act uh, talk as if you're partnered up with them when they're talking with the agent. You just might not have a sign agreement. Um, then we are going to set clear search criteria. What does that mean? Um, what, whatever they're looking for. To see yes. This is where you are in the buyer console, probably, where you are going to list out their wants and their needs and almost prioritize them. Is it more important for you to have three bedrooms or, or four bedrooms, or would you rather have an unfinished basement? Like, you know, in this, this is where you should ask why. If you can go three times, if someone says, I would like four bedrooms, why is that? Why do you need four bedrooms? Oh, well, I'd like to have an office. Oh, why is that? Or do you work from home? Or do you need that space? Um, as you find these things out, you can start to fill in the gaps of what their thinking is. If you just go four bedrooms, cool. What's your search going to look like? Four bedrooms. Can you show them a five bedroom house? Can you show them a three bedroom house? Can you show them a two bedroom house with an unfinished basement? Like, you don't know unless you start drilling deeper. So when you're setting these clear search criteria, I would get the why behind it. You know, when someone says, I want to live in Vineyard. Great. Why? Oh, it's actually 10 minutes from my office. And I love how close that is. Cool. Well, where's your office? Well, it's in Orem. Great. So if, what if we found something in Orem? Would you be okay with that if it was within 10 minutes? What about if we go north and go to like PG, Linden, American Fork, and you could get there in 10 minutes? What if we go down to Provo? Like, is 10 minutes the number or is Vineyard the place? Right? You can start dialing in that. Is this something you do in person? Like, hey, let's have yep. a meeting and talk to me, let's figure it out. Like, could we do drills here? Or yep. Do that yep. So you can get percent? any of the rooms. Uh, you can book them online. It's a complicated process. You have to click like 18 times to get to where you actually book them. Uh, so I was just ask the front desk, like, hey, we need this room. Or there's a little QR code on each of the rooms, and then you can scan that and book it out later. Um, Could we do it over in an informal setting? Yep. We can do that as well. Yep. Yeah. The more professional you make it, the easier it is, I've always found. So I like a professional setting. Um, then I go over, I call it LTP Mama, but not all of these apply. Um, so I talk about location, location, that's wrong, right? Timeline, price, motivation, um, agent, mortgage. And then this last one stands for appointment. So this is the pre-approval process that I always take people through. And then I will clarify a lot of this in the appointment. Where do you want to be? When do you want to be there? 
How much can you pay for that? Why do you want to make all of this? Like, why now? Is often a question I have. Have you talked to any other agents? And if so, have you signed anything? Uh, which is also, have you gone to see any houses? If they've seen any houses, they've probably signed something. Um, do you need a mortgage? And if so, do you have a lender? And then let's set an appointment if it's pre-approval. If not, it's when are we going to go see houses? Or what's our next step? What's our next time that we're meeting? LPP Mama, what you spell looking at. Is that how you spell? Looks wrong to me. After that, sometimes, yeah, I'll say words like, and they say all day, and then yeah. I look at it and like, wait. Yeah, there's a word for that. I learned it from Ted Lasso, but I can never remember what it is where words start to sound like sounds. Oh, Ted Lasso is the best show ever. Apple TV. Apple TV. It's the only reason you need to pay for Apple TV. So, um, Oh, so this is kind of my process. Some people have taken this and, and built like a sheets. So, cause the thing is, is none of this talks about like how many beds and baths and things like that, which is all helpful. So it's like, you are starting to like build a search. So my buyer's appointment looks a lot like answering these questions and filling out uh, on the MLS, like a search criteria is how I run things. So if you can get this, then you're great. Yes. If I find a, a seller and they want to sell, but they also want to buy, they don't know where they want to buy. They're not sure exactly when they want to sell, but they want to start the process. In. Are we working through both the buying and selling process at the same time, or do you do one first? And then yep. The yep. Typically they have more questions about one or the other. Uh, when they're sellers, they've already gone through the buying process. So you probably won't need to be like, okay, so here's where we are and here's where we're going because they've done that. Um, it might be different. You might need to re remind them. I mean, right now, I think the average buyer buys every 10 years is what it is. It used to be seven. It kind of fluctuates based on rates and market and things like that. But so with that is I would sit down um, and even following this same kind of an idea. So price is going to be determined a lot on what you think the house will sell for. I, I have a buddy lives in Harriman. He really wants to go buy a new house. So he's like, I want to keep my payment at 3000 or lower. And I'm like, good luck. <laughs> you are in a, in a $400,000 townhome already, which... What's the, like, that's close to a $3,000 payment if he were to buy that today. So now he's got to sell, but he actually could have 25% down, have a bunch of money in his pocket and probably be close to that $3,000 a month payment. So we've been talking a lot more on the sales side because it all depends on how much he can make for it. And then we'll go out shopping, but we'll still be like, where do you want to live? When do you want to do that? Why? Can you talk to any other that we talk mortgage? Like we're still going to go through this whole process. It just might be a little quicker for the buy side and then more on the sell side or vice versa. And so that's kind of like feeling it out, answering their questions and things like that. Okay. But you have to show your value either way because if they don't see your value, they don't want to pay you. So the more that you can show them this, the better off they are. Can you do both transactions? Can you help them yep. sell their house and buy the new house? That's you like should. Cool. No. Nope. Yeah, because it's different houses. Same person. Yep. Okay. And like if you're sitting in, a, in an open house, for example, that's your listing and a buyer walks in and says, I need to buy a house, but I don't like this one. You can help that person buy a different house. Is there any way you would start a, a approaching that kind of a problem? Like, would you go for selling it first or would you go for helping to find a new home? First, what would you um yes so there's a couple things is uh where would they live is the biggest question that i have and so if they're like oh i just move in with my parents it's like well then let's start selling because it's really easy to sell a, or buy a house when you don't have a contingency to sell a house right there in the rep you can mark that there you have to sell this house before you buy a house so like if you're making a buyer offer um and then so you can you can go out 
buying, which is usually more of the fun thing to get them excited, right? The whole, the whole idea of this process. So before you're partnering with them and like actually getting an agreement signed, you are, it's, it's lead generation mode. You're just trying to gather as many people, talk to as many people and get them to appointments. Once you make an offer and negotiate and you're finally under contract, this is just the natural progression. Where most people get lost is in kind of this messy middle. You know, they're like, I'd love to buy a house. And then it just kind of doesn't really go anywhere. There is this skill of getting people to move forward. There's two real things that I think you need to do for this. Number one is knowing their motivation, right? And I've already forgotten what the question was but I'm rambling on this. So know their motivation. Why do they even want to move? And can you use that against them? That sounds bad. In a good way, use that against them. Most people want to move for a reason, but they get scared. And so whatever is getting in their way is their motivation bigger than that, right? Are they going to run towards pleasure or away from fear kind of a concept? Um. The other thing is removing any roadblocks that they might have. So this might be where they're like, I have to sell my house before I buy a house. Well, it's like, what if we look at some houses, we can actually make them contingent on you selling your house because that might speed them up in the process of listing their house. They know they want to do it. They're ready to do it. They just don't know they're ready for it. Or it's like, if I sold your house too fast, where would you live? And if they have a plan for that, like, great. Well, let's list. And then, then they, they build this urgency in their mind, right? If I have to move in with my parents or my in-laws, there is zero chance that I'm dragging my feet about buying a house. I am moving quick. So like, if you can list a house, then the buying moves fast. If they find the house that they want to buy, then the listing moves fast. But it's just kind of like, where do you go to move things quickly? Is really the idea here. Um, time expectation, right? This fits into this timeline piece. If I told you I wanted to move in in November, when do I need to start looking for a home? Right now. Isn't that crazy to think about? So the closing process takes about 30 days. So we're one month out from that. If they are going to get pre-approved, which will, I mean, it takes like 20 minutes to get pre-approved, but it will take a normal buyer a day or two. So you get pre-approved. We got to meet in the office. We have to make a game plan. We have to find some houses to go see. Um, we probably will not find the first or find the house on the first outing. That does not mean that it does not happen, but the, usually people will need two or three times going out before they make an offer. So you are going to see houses two or three times. That's going to take a week or two plus the week or two to get everything ready and rolling and the game plan and then a 30 day close period, maybe some negotiations, maybe you'll make an offer and it won't get accepted. And then you'll be on to the next house trying to find it. Like if you're moving, if you want to move in in November, it's probably now. If you're building a house, you can always ask builders this, but typically it's about six months for them to build a house from the plan is picked and the lot is approved for that plan. That's, that could be a one to three month process of its own. But once like, like this house will fit on this lot and the city's okay with it, from point on is usually six months before they move in. It could be faster depending on uh, what hoops they've jumped through. And it's like they dig a hole and pour the foundation and all of a sudden they go vertical. It looks like so much happened so quickly. And then it looks like nothing is ever happening again because it's like all these little incremental things that people are doing it's like just the front plumbers there just the electrician so it goes up real fast but then you don't see a lot of progress real fast for buying so if you want to buy a new home that you're building you probably want six to nine months so when should you sell your house if it's six to nine months out depends if you, have somewhere else to live. Depends if you know where you're gonna live right Allie, the new agent that's in our group, she has a short or er, midterm rentals, fully furnished. So 
if you like you want to just pay rent for something that's not long term that you can just say we're going to move in into this new house boom you could rent that from her if they have parents if they have family if they have something if they don't you're probably about about a week to get everything ready to put on the market and then average days on market right now what is it 45 yeah. you can send an email on friday something like that um yeah, Dean sends an email out every Friday that has stats. That's the only thing I look at in the email. Every time I read the other other articles, I'm like, this is good. Thanks for sending that out, Dean. Mm -hmm. And then I don't read a single article that he sends for like, <laughs> like six more weeks. Um, so you probably want to leave yourself a little bit of time. What if you list too high and then you need to lower the price after two weeks or three weeks? And then you finally get an offer and they have to sell their house. Like listing two months early is probably great. And just figure out a lease back. So time expectations are huge. Setting this. Uh, document expectations. What documents do you need to sign to buy a home? You guys know? Quiz time. Buy a home? Yep. You're going to be the buyer. What do you need to do? Pepsi. Mm -hmm. broker agreement yep doing the offer which could be addendum and all these things but at least that okay what else um if you're like with my situation to his family you have to have yep a, um, um so what do they call that disclosure disclosure of interest yeah um yeah you also had to do a limited agency agreement because okay. the buyer's agent was at our brokerage um Buyers need to sign, it's called the due diligence checklist, everything you should do once you find the home. They need to do a, we'll yeah. see, yeah. mold, yeah. what else do they do? A wire fraud mm -hmm. alert. Both sellers and buyers need to do that one. Um, this is why I use Jeanette, because I feel like yeah. I'm always forgetting the documents. We also have this addendum that says the owners of this brokerage also own real advantage title or a part of it. And so if you use them or not, I don't know if you're not using them. I don't know why we have to disclose that. But if you use them, we have to disclose that even though you all don't own real advantage title. Yeah. And it's so convenient that they're right there. So you should use them and they're awesome. And I'm part owner of them. So definitely use them. <laughs> like maybe... Maybe a tenth of a percent. I don't know. It's like nothing that I own. We had to do addendum to Rep C for seller finance. Seller finance addendum. So you could have a lot of documents. So how I set expectations of this is I get them to sign the buyer broker agreement in the appointment. I say, um, my transition is, do you know how I get paid? Uh, what? No matter what they say, yes or no. I say, well, let me tell you. Or if they say, yep, so, oh, cool, because you probably buy houses all the time. I'm like, oh, it's been a little while, but I know that the sellers pay your commission. I'm like, cool, maybe. Um, so then I give them the buyer broker agreement. I'm like, this defines how I'm going to get paid. What it says in here is that I will get paid 3% when the house closes. Now, this could be a bunch of different sources. And my very favorite is a seller pays me. Sometimes the other agent will pay me. Sometimes I'll get some money from the lender. And the very worst case scenario is that you will have to pay me on closing. If that happens, you will definitely know up front and you will definitely be okay with it before we're moving forward. This is not going to be a at closing, oh, by the way, you owe me $15,000 kind of a conversation. This will be a, hey, we put an offer in on this and I am not going to get paid. We need to figure out how to get me paid. Do you still want this house? Kind of a conversation. And that is me kind of negotiating and quickly walking through the buyer broker agreement. And then when I get that sign, I'll say, great. Now, when we are officially making an offer, I have a whole bunch more paperwork for you to sign. Besides just the offer, everything that goes on, be very available and ready to sign things. A few of them are time sensitive. Others we just need before closing. But I'm just going to be sending you documents. If you ever have a question, let me know. Yes. Is there a change to the way that uh, a buyer's 
paying their agent in the contract? Is there like a sort of? Thing? Yep. So there was the yeah the NAR settlement. It happened about a month ago. It went into effect. It didn't change a whole lot in Utah, but it did change. We don't have the commission on the MLS, which is how we used to do it. Um, so if I worked for the seller, I would say, hey, seller, what do you want to offer buyer's agent? Oh, 3%, great. And I would put that on the MLS. And that was like the cooperation. So you as a buyer's agent would see the MLS and see 3% and know I would pay you 3%. So me as the listing agent, I would collect 6% and I would give 3% to you. Kind of an idea. Well, then the MLS can't put commission on it anymore. So now you need to figure out who is paying you and how much. So as the buyer's agent, that you kind of talked it through it. Hey, it could be the seller paying me, yep. it could be you paying me, it could be the broker. Or... Yep, I always put the the buyers last. Are there scripts for yeah. that that they go over for how to best manage yep. the situation? Yep, and that, and to be honest, that's the best one. It's like there's a lot of ways that I can get paid. Um, most sellers are willing to pay buyers, buyers agent for bringing them a buyer. Try to see that value. If they don't, a lot of the time, the listing agent will and will have that worked in. So that's my first two. I'm going to go to them. And um, and then the third way is I'm going to involve our lender somehow to get some of that paid through some of the closing costs. And sometimes it's a combination of all of that. And then the very last case scenario, I'm going to come to you and ask money for money. But I will... You will know this up front as we were figuring out if this is the house for you. And then it's kind of up to you as the buyer's agent. If like um, Amy, for example, has a seller that doesn't want to pay a full seller commission or buyer's agent commission, the million dollar home, and he is going to counter offer these people and say, I'll pay you a percent and a half. So that's when it's up to you to be like, okay, is a percent and a half of a million dollars, what's that, $15,000? Yeah, 15,000, I don't know why I looked at you, Bart, like you're going to be my math guy here. $15,000 to sell. So then you have to think, is that enough? Or am I going to have to see if the lender will put some of that in, which means raising the rate a little bit? Or do I need to ask the buyers for a little bit more? And all of those are real. But uh, in that scenario, I'd probably be okay with 15 grand for a million dollar home. If it's a $400,000 home, and they're like, I'll give you 1%. Then you're like, I feel like I'm doing too much work for yeah. not making enough. And that's how it was split at these other finances. It was, yeah, it was, it was a weird thing. one. Yeah, where all the commission is coming from, down payment, even though the, the sellers are the buyer's agents, or the buyer paid for the buyer's agent's commission, and my sellers paid my commission. Yeah. And we still both, even Kylie, she knew I should have 1%. Yeah, she the buyers. Yep. Yeah, we both did one percent. So there's some times where you're like, I did, I need to take less to make the deal work, and then there's other times where you're like, buyers, you know what? This isn't going to work unless I get money. And to be honest, it's a hundred percent up to you. If you need to blame me, I am very happy to be that person that says you need to make three percent and have a difficult conversation. Might be our next slide. Oh no. We're going to talk about difficult conversations. Okay, set communication expe expectations. What's your favorite way to communicate with someone? Like, like, let's just talk like for real. Here I am. I'm your your coach. How would you like me to communicate with you if I was going to check in like on a weekly basis? Live question. It probably be over the phone. In person, great. It's just if I'm here. Um, in person, if you're here, over the phone. Is that a call or a text? Call. You want a text, an email? Would that do it for you? Text. It's gonna be scheduled Yeah. What if I was like on Thursday at three o'clock? I'll check in with you. What are you expecting when I said that? A phone call. A phone call. Maybe in person, right? But the like, I'll check in with you almost makes it seem like you just need to sit back and relax, and something can happen. If at three o'clock I don't call you. And I'm like, well, you never called me. It was three o'clock. You're supposed to call me. I messed up. Same exact thing with your, your buyers and your sellers. Set the expectation. How often are you going to, going to communicate and how is that going to be? 
If you are going to send them a text update and they are okay with it, by all means, that's probably the easiest thing to do. That is not going to help you build the relationship and get more referrals as much as a phone call or in-person visit. But in-person visits are hard. And to be honest, if my agent came to my house every week, I'd be like, stop it. Stop coming to my house. Uh, phone calls are my favorite. But set this and get their buy-in. If they hate text messages, never text them. If they don't look at their email, you should text or call them whenever you send them an email they need to look at, right? Hey, I just sent you an offer to your email. Look it over, right? You can't send an email and hope that they look at it and then reach out to you. All of my emails say, call me once you look at this kind of an idea. Like when you get an offer, I say, here's the whole breakdown of the offer. Call me when you get this. Do you know what I do when I send that email? I call them. <laughs> but if I send that out, and they're like on top of their email, like a few people are, they're going to call me before I call them, but you never know. So setting those communication expectations and it's asking them what they want and telling them what you're going to do. Um, contingencies. It seems like a strange word for uh, what it really means, which is, uh, do you ever go out of town? And what does that look like for your buyers or your sellers? I just went out of town the other day. My cousin wants to buy a house. Uh, we were going like, we saw houses a couple days in a, in a row, kind of a thing. We put in an offer and then they got scared and backed out. Like, oh, I'm not ready. They're like, we think he's going to get a promotion, but maybe he's not like the husband. And so I'm like, you know what? That's fine. We can kind of cool. I'll keep sending you houses every once in a while. Um, I'll check in every so often. Anyway, I'm getting ready to go out of town and... She calls me and she's like, I found the house that we might want. I said, great. I'm not around. Let me have someone go show you. Someone showed her the house. Like, we want to put in an offer. I said, great. Do you know when she said I want to put in an offer? When I was sitting in the airport. <laughs> Do you know what contingency is I had planned for her? Maybe I won't show you the house. That was my only contingency that I told her. And so she was fine when some other agent showed her the house. When I was sitting in the airport, I was writing an offer and sending it to her as I was walking on the plane. Luckily, the plane had Wi-Fi. It was multiple offers. We lost out, so nothing really happened there. But so set contingencies. If you're going to go out of town, like uh, with my sellers, I check in every single Friday because I don't want them to call me on Saturday or Sunday and be like, what's going on? So Friday afternoon, I call my sellers, say, hey, I want to give you a quick update. If my quick update is no one saw the house and you know this, that is my update. Hey, we had a quiet week. Why don't we reassess things next week? Like that might be it. If I'm going to be gone on Friday, I will call them on Thursday and be like, I am gone tomorrow. So I figured I'd call you today to give you my weekly update as I'm gone tomorrow. I'm going to still be here. If you go on vacation, you can completely unplug, but you need some help, right? Austin, if you're gone, you could be like, yeah, if you, if like set me as a co-agent, that's a real thing. You can set another agent as a co-agent. I can get the offers. I can send them to your sellers completely like that. It is a little bit harder. Um, but like, if you're going on a cruise, go on a cruise, enjoy it. Just figure out who are you going to partner with for this? And what does that mean for them? Right. Austin, if you're going to go to a cruise and you're like, I need help and I'm going to help you. And then I end up with an unrepresented buyer that I then negotiate and put under contract and their cash or their closing in a week. So you come home after your seven day cruise and you're like, just in time for the closing table. Like you better pay me some good money because I got you everything what you wanted and I did all of the work. If I'm like, I just kind of sat there and nothing happened, then don't pay me very much kind of a thing. But so set contingencies, you can make plans like that. Also, when your sellers are out of town, that is the best time to show their house. So if they're like, oh, we're going to go to Lake Powell this weekend. Great. I'm going to have a big open house. You cool with that? You're going to be gone. I'm not going to bug you. Leave your house clean. And then we're going to do that. So um, you can also, with this, very important. Um, and this is more of the working with other agents section that we'll talk about. Read the MLS. Often it will say things like, I'm out of town. Don't give me a deadline this weekend, set your deadline to Monday or you will not get a response kind of a thing. So 
pay attention to those things. Showing remarks often has like, give us a few hours to schedule. So you, you can't be like, oh, hey, we just drove by this house as we're showing others. You want to see it? That won't happen. So, uh, set up-to-date market expectations. How do you know the best up-to-date market expectations that you should set? How are you, how are you keeping up to date with the market? Um, comparables. Yep. Uh, what so? Yeah. When when you have a listing, you should set yourself up on a hot sheet on the MLS listing alert. What do they call it? Whatever. Listing alert. Yeah, listing alert of everything for sale in that person's neighborhood. Because you know what's going to happen? They are going to go driving into their neighborhood one day and they're going to see a sign. And they're going to think, I wonder what that means for my house that's now listed. If you call them and say, hey, I noticed that one of your neighbors just went for sale, they're going to be impressed. And then even more impressed if you could say, oh, I looked at this and I think they're actually overpriced. And so this helped, this helps us. It will bring people to the neighborhood, but I think more people will see your house because of this. Like there's good about having multiple listings, right? There's a reason all the car dealers go next to each other because it helps more people go, right? You're only going to buy one car, but you might go to multiple dealerships looking at all of the cars. Same thing with houses. There's a few houses for sale on the neighborhood. That could be a good thing. Yes, you have more competition. You have to look better. But each of those houses are, have a marketing plan that hopefully are driving traffic that will, you will benefit from. So that's how to get uber local. How else can you stay up to date with market? There's a lot of little things like Dean sends an email with market stats. Like he's pulling those from the MLS so you could do the same or you could just wait to every Friday and see some things where he says months of inventory, days on market, list to sold. Like he updates that every single day and then he's sending it out once a week. Um, and so you could you could learn from that. Uh, the other thing is once a quarter, Keller Williams does a market update for Utah. Um, the next one's in October. And so we'll go over like the, the quarter we're in right now. And we have all that data in October. And you should watch it because I'm going to be on it this time. Yeah, so I'm running it for... Oh, like YouTube, like yeah, so and if you want to watch the past one, if you go to kwutah.tv, it will go right to their YouTube channel. kwutah.com is is like the regional website, and then uh, it will go, you can go watch the old one, um, just kind of see how things are changing. It's always a good one. Um, they're trying to promote KW Tech. I want to set expectation with technology. Where do people look for homes right now? So, uh, Where else? KWs. Red Fan, KWs. They will go find everywhere possible. Here's, I have watched my wife do this multiple, multiple times. Like, I don't tell her that I'm watching her and she's like on the laptop looking for houses when she does, but she will start by looking on some website, usually wherever I start her. So I'm like, go to kw.com and start looking for houses. She will go there and start finding houses. What happens when she runs out of information or houses? She goes to somewhere else. She's on a Zillow, on a homes.com. She will be like Googling homes for sale in Orem and end up on some other website and end up everywhere. Is that a bad thing? It's just not very efficient. And it's definitely not efficient. Yeah, she's going to save a home she likes on all these different websites and keep track of them. Yep. So if she ends up on, for example, redsign.com looking for houses, do you know what's going to happen? She can look for a house or two, and then she will have to register for their website. So you can look through a couple of pictures, and then you have to register. And then she's going to get called from some other. And then she's going to get called from the Red Sign team. And if she doesn't answer, do you know what they're going to do? They're going to text her. If she doesn't answer. She, they're going to email her. They have a whole, I think they call what they do with 10 days of pain. So every day she's going to get some sort of communication from them. 
if she was not my wife and she was a random person that I kind of like a referral from my sphere that I'm kind of working and kind of helping is one of their marketing reach outs, one of their emails or texts or calls going to convert that person to meet with the red side team instead of me? Maybe. So I like to update my clients and tell them things. I tell them, Hey, the very best place to look is on either the app that I will send you, right? That you can just send right from command or kw.com. Um, and I send them my website. I tell them that these are the best places because I can see what they're favoriting. So that way, when they're like, hey, let's go look at houses on Thursday. I say, great. It looks like you have five favorites. We should probably go see three of them. I think these are the best three. Are you okay with these three? They say, yep, let's go. And that's our whole communication. That is the ultimate easiest. The next best place to look for houses is utahrealestate.com. And I tell them that this is the MLS. This is the most up-to-date, like such that agents get fined if they put wrong information on the MLS, which is semi-true. Uh, but you can be fined. You're not always fined. Um, so that will have almost all of the houses. The one thing that both of those websites miss are for sale by owners, which I think the best place to find is on the Facebook marketplace or on KSL. If you are looking on those, if it is a for sale by owner, it will not list a brokerage. If it does list the brokerage, it is also on kw.com and or utahrealestate.com. And I will tell them this. So if you get on like the Facebook marketplace and like something, I will tell them, take a screenshot of that and send it to me and I can do all the digging. If you're on KSL, screenshot it. I'll go find all of that. Send me things that way. And then, uh, and it's however, however else they're looking for. Um, by the way, you should give all of your sphere, your, your app, or your KW website so they can look at houses. People enjoy looking at houses. Might as well say, hey, if you ever wanna see a house, go to my website, my app. I like the KW app because like, if I go travel, I just went to Tallahassee the other day, right? I fly to Tallahassee, I see a for sale sign, you know what I do? Boom, pull up the app. I don't have to call, I don't have to text, I don't have to do anything. I can know instantly the whole nation. Yep, find near me and uh, we'll zoom right in. So it's super nice. You're like just exploring another state. Like, what yep. do you do with that? Um, in my mind, I think, should I buy an Airbnb here? And the answer is always maybe. And that's as far as I get. I'm constantly looking for opportunities and never pulling the trigger. Um, but sometimes it's just like, like you're like, man, I'm staying at this like cool lake house or whatever. I wonder how much homes right here costs, you know? I'm at this Airbnb, I wonder how much another one costs. I do all the time with like friends who like, yeah. to be in an area, like that's a really nice house. Like you can look, let's see what it is, what it's going for, or yeah. what other properties go for. But so you can look at other houses that aren't even listed. Uh, if Not you're on, yeah, on utahrealestate.com you can, cause you're an agent, so you get all of that information. Mm -hmm. On kw.com you can, but kw.com works for the whole nation. So wherever you are, it works. But when someone's like, oh, hey, did you see our neighbors just sold? I'll pull up utahrealestate.com. They're like, oh yeah, looks like they sold for this much. So the, what that what that means for your house is this. Um, three steps for gaining referrals. This seems like a stupid way to put it, but we'll run with it. Number one, you have to provide your value. Do what you can and go above and beyond. This is a huge little box to kind of generalize, but if you do great, you will get referrals if you then ask for them. So my formula is be awesome at everything that I do or I promise to do, like exceed expectations and then ask them for referrals, not for help, but for referrals. Don't use the word referrals. Just ask them like, oh, hey, do you know anyone else like you? 
my favorite line is, it's been awesome working with you. I want to find more people like me, like you. Do you have any friends or family that are looking to buy or sell right now? Or that should buy or sell right now? And sometimes I'll even correct myself like that. Like, do you have anyone looking to buy or sell? Or really anyone that you think should buy or sell? And then when they give you a referral, you give them a reward. You can give them up to $250 for giving you a referral for a closing. I suggest when someone gives you a referral, you reward that behavior, right? This is the Pavlov's dog type of an idea. He rings the bell, the dog gets hungry because every time he rang the bell, the dog would eat. And so um, when people think of real estate, you want them to think of you. When they think of you, you give them a reward to ingrain that behavior. The reward could be very easy little dumb things like you could send them a $5 Swift gift card. Super as simple as that. You could stop by their house and say thanks. Like whatever you wanted to do, you give them some sort of reward. And then that is every time you get a referral. Is every referral gonna close? No. But if you reward the behavior, you're gonna end up cementing that thought of people giving you referrals. Um, you should ask reviews for people and you should do it often. The best time to ask for a review after something good happens. You do not have to close a transaction with someone to get a referral, or I mean, a well, referral too, but a review. So right now you could actually be asking friends and family that know you to write you reviews. Because if you end up meeting with some seller, like you set an appointment with a seller that you've never met before, what's the first thing they're going to do before you meet? They're going to go look you up. What are they going to find if they Google you? Nothing. Is that going to make them feel better or worse? So if you get someone that starts Googling you, you are worse off than, than not. So my suggestion is go set up a Google local, no, Google local services is the ads, the Google business page, whatever they call it. Um, even if it's just your name at KW Westfield, whatever that is, and go ask a handful of people to give you reviews. Say, will you Google my name and then find my business page and write me a review? Or I think it gives you an exact link that you can send them. Um, and then try to go get five to 10 right off the bat. Most real estate agents have less than that. So if someone Googles you, you do that. If you want to get online leads, Google local services is one of the best paid lead sources that you can get, but they base it off of the reviews. The more reviews you have, the more leads you get. So set up the, that Google. You can also do Facebook reviews. You can do Zillow reviews, homes.com has reviews, realtor.com has reviews, LinkedIn has reviews. Try to gather them all into one place. My very favorite is Google because if you were going to start paying for ads, the easiest one to get them is Google. So, um, and then let people know that you're going to ask them for reviews. Hey, part of working with me is I want to do such a great service that two things happen. Besides you selling your house and being so happy, I want you to love me so much that you give me referrals. Like literally anytime anyone you know wants to buy or sell, you say, you should work with this guy. And number two is that you write me a review to help me with all of those other people that you don't know, right? Have you guys ever written a review on Amazon? I have never done that. I think about it all the time. Who are these people that write all of these reviews? Like, thank goodness for them because I never do. If I'm writing a review, it's a bad one. <laughs> it's the only bad one. Yeah. So tell them that you expect a review and uh, referrals at the same time. Buyer reviews. When can a buyer give you a review? Anytime. Anytime. Good. You were paying attention. They don't have to close a deal. They don't have to actually be a buyer. They don't have to be a seller. Go ask for their reviews right now. Get them to write something. And if you'll notice, um, you can almost like say what they should write, right? 
If your purchasing or selling experience exceeded your expectations, would you be so kind to give me a brief review? I'd like to use this in my advertising marketing. I would even add like mention that I'm trustworthy or something like that. Whatever you want to build up as people are reading, you can tell people to, to mention that. So um, it's not a weird thing to send out a text to close friends and family. These are like your VIP type of people. You want to get some reviews. Um, all right. We're going to run through the rest real fast. Success with buyers. The biggest chunk of buyers, 52%, say they want help finding the right home to purchase. They're like, that's two big things. Finding and the right. Like I mentioned, my friend, I would not let him buy that home that he did. High HOA, two bedrooms, like not a great home for him in his situation. So I would have said no. I think he signed a listing agreement with me because I told him that, right? Um, next is negotiate the terms of the sale, help with other price negotiations and then a whole bunch of other, it's like paperwork and stuff like that. But they don't care about as much. So if you were building out your value proposition and what you want to do for buyers, you can say, I help find the right home to purchase, negotiate it, and make sure that you have the right price for you. Boom. I just covered three quarters of the people in one sentence. Like That is my value proposition. Something like that. Uh, this is actually from 2021. If you go to NAR, like I just Google NAR buyer home profile or something like that, and home buyer profile. I don't know what I say. Um, let's see, because this is the profile of home buyers and sellers. Yeah, so you could do that. And you could find what 2023 is was like. So as as we as we talked about with this LTP mama. You could build this into some sort of checklist or thing. I would put this right in your buyer packet that you do like a needs analysis. So, and then ask me questions like this. Who will be living in this home? Boom, write them all out. I'd get their age. Uh, this is probably, you could even ask who potentially could be living there, right? Do you have like older parents? Do you have older kids that might be moving back in? Uh, what are the non-negotiables, right? I need a fenced-in yard. I have two dogs. So that's a non-negotiable. If I find a house without a fence, I better be getting it at a discount so I can build a fence. Um, interesting enough, the one of the questions, what are the non-negotiables for your home? And then the next one is, if you have to name your top five, what would they be? Beyond your top five, what do you really need, right? Do you have a pre preference on the year built? Do you want a garage? Like little things like that. Right? Do you want to move in ready? you want to do some work? When people visit your home, what do you want them to say about you? Right, there's some interesting things there. Any specific features? Will you require accessibility? Whatever. Um, there's two ways to think about this. I don't really like this slide, but when you move into a new home, you are either going to change like just little things about your life, like your new location, or you're going to change kind of how you are, like your world changes, right? You, you might be like, oh, I drive shorter to work now, but I don't have a garage. Right, your whole world change, your life change. Um, the dumb slides. Now, with this, you are going to have to have some tough conversations sometimes. Uh, they say that this is the fiduciary conversation. Um, there are things that are going to come up that just aren't great. For example, Amy has this listing. They got an offer that had zero percent buyer's commission, which is exactly what the seller wanted and um, the price that he wanted, everything so great. After one week, they canceled. So then Amy had to call him 
and say the buyers back out. Now they didn't have a good reason, but um, other things that, that you're gonna have to have tough conversations with specifically about buyers is you're being unrealistic, right? Um, who was talking to me the other day? Someone was talking to me that her brother wants to buy a million dollar home and he just got out of jail. He has a job doing like some woodworking something that does not pay that much, but he wants a million dollar home. His parents are going to help buy some land for him, but he'd rather have them buy him a million dollar home. I'm like, that's unrealistic. Like, you need to slap your brother in the face and say, you're not going to get a million dollar home because why? You, you don't deserve it. So sometimes you might have to, like, someone's like, I want a basement apartment in my house and I don't want my payment to be over $1,500. That does not exist right now. So you're going to have to say, no, <laughs> that's not realistic. I don't think we can get that. I will definitely look for it. However, we are not going to get it with that price in that area, whatever, right? If you wanted a $1,500 a month payment, you can find that. You are not going to be in Salt Lake or Utah County probably. You probably won't even be in Juab County. Maybe Delta, maybe something junky. That's what Stuff I like that. mine because we had talking to them about they, what they listed it at, what we listed it at. Mm -hmm. I couldn't talk on the down from it. You know, I knew it looked like having 30 to 40,000 less than that. And even when we were negotiating the deal, they were like, we think it's worth more. And it's like, yeah, just do it. I'm like, because they're trying to get as much out of it. I'm yeah. Like, are you scratching all the value out of this? Like, do you, what you think your property's worth does not reflect what it's actually worth. Yeah, work. and that is one of the toughest conversations is to walk into a seller's house and be like, problems, issues. Like, look at all of these things. Oh, and by the way, what you think it's going to sell for will not sell for that. I My presentation, I often bring comps and I'll like, put them on the, the table and be like, this house sold for this much in this many days and look at it. This house sold for this many days in this many days for this price, look at it. And they're like, we're better than both of those. And I look around and I think, no, you're not. You're not. You tell them that? So you um, I have to figure out a better way to do it. Uh, but you're not direct. Sometimes I am. Yeah, my, my last listing, when I walked in, the first thing I noticed on the floor, because I go into this buyer mode of like, I'm going to go buy this house. There was like paint. Like you could tell they paint, they like taped around the baseboards and then painted the baseboards, but then some spilled over. Mm -hmm. So it was like, there was like a line in the baseboard that was clean and then a little bit of like paint. And I was like, paint, I see paint. I see dents on the floor. The carpet looks worn. And so like their dogs had eaten part of the carpet. So I'm like, a, a question that I'll ask, often ask people on a scale of one to 10, how honest do you want me to be? 10 being, I'm that buyer that just walked through who's OCD and I'm just gonna tell you directly how it is. One being like, you ask your grandma if she thinks you're pretty, kind of a, <laughs> like, where do you want me to fall in that? And they usually tend to, put on the higher and I will always go lower than what they say. But I like, if we went through this building to buy, look at all of these paint chips. I would mention when buyers are gonna notice these things and they're not gonna like it because they're gonna see they have to paint this whole wall. If you don't have the same color, now they have to repaint this whole room. And so they walk in and think, I need to do all of these things. So I'm going to point these things out to you and we're going to figure out what the best way is to solve them. So I was like, I noticed that there's a crack in your flooring. He's like, oh yeah, I have extra boards. I can fix that. Great. Your baseboards definitely have been scuffed up. It looks like by kit. And they're like, yep, they ride scooters inside and rub up against the wall. Like, do you have that paint still? Can you still paint that? Like, these are all of the things that everyone's going to find. Um, they wanted to stage the house. And I said, don't stage the house while you have your children here. You need to move out first because your house, 
your children are going to jump on the staging furniture. So we had like some of these harder conversations, but I got their buy-in that I could be honest with them. So sometimes you'll have to have those. Sometimes you'll be like, you're not being realistic kind of conversations. Um, when you show homes, you need to make sure that when you get your needs analysis, that the homes actually match up with that. If they don't, you need to call them out on that. If they're like, we need four bedrooms and they send you a three bed three bedroom house and they're like, we want to look at this. You can say, wait, you told me to find you a four bedroom house. This is a three bedroom house. What has changed since we talked about a four bedroom house for you to like this? And if they're like, well, it's just a cute area and thing. Like if you did not have that fourth bedroom, would you be okay with it? And if they're like, well, maybe we shouldn't see this. Right. There's a whole lot in showing homes. Oh, good. Um, yes. Is there any value in showing homes that do differ from their needs? Like if you think that it might be worth showing them? Yep. Yep. A hundred percent. Especially if you've gone out multiple times and they have not made an offer. Um, which, uh, by the way, is some scripts that we can talk about. But if, if you've gone out and seen the same types of homes over and over, and they're just not making offers, you can be like, you know what? We're going to go out again, and I'm going to throw you a curveball. I'm going to show you something completely different that we haven't seen, and you tell me how it fits. So you should have some way that you are gathering all of this information, right? Maybe write, like, if you're a paper person and you fill out a needs analysis in the buyer appointment, on the back of that, every time you show a house, you write it down and you write the feedback. Like MLS number, like I print out an MLS for every single showing that I do. I have like a little folder, which uh, I'll talk about in a sec, but we'll just do it now. I have a little folder that I have with me that I have every single MLS. I have the old ones that we saw and I saw I have like the new ones that we're seeing. I write the day I'm showing it and the time on the top of every single one. Then on the back, I write down any information that they tell me that I feel like I need to know. Nine times out of 10, re me re writing it down is enough for me to remember it. Every once in a while, I'm like, what did we say about this one? And I'll have to go back and read it. But then I keep all of those in this folder. I keep the folder in my car or in my office as I'm showing houses. That way, when they say things like, oh, I really like that home two times ago. I can be like, you were saying this and this and this that it didn't have. This house has all of those things. Where's the disconnect? Like, do we need to find something between this? Do we need to find something more like that or whatever? Um, so with that, you should only show the best properties to your buyer. There was an agent uh, in our brokerage for years and years and years. I don't even think he sells real estate anymore because he made so much money selling real estate. He invested in so many properties and now he's investing in companies. Um, he would say, I'm going to show you three properties. They are the best deals on the market that fit your criteria. After we see these three properties, I expect you to write an offer on one of them. Are you okay with that? You know what people would say? Yep. He would show three properties. They would write an offer and go under contract. If their offer did not get accepted, he would do the same thing. Great. Sounds like we, we tried. We didn't get this one. We're going to do the same thing. I'll find you three properties that meet your criteria. We will make an offer on one of them. When he was doing this at like the height of his career, there were more homes for sale than like probably like four or five times as many homes for sale right now. So he, most agents were showing 20 to 30 homes to get a sale. He was showing three to six. If they saw the three and they didn't want to make an offer, he would say, did I get it wrong on it? And if they said no, he said, then it sounds like you're not looking for a good deal. You're looking for the perfect house. I am going to get you a great deal on a house that fits your criteria. If that's not okay with you, I'm not the agent for you. And he closed like a hundred houses, him and an assistant, like 80 to a hundred, like four or five years in a row. So definitely, definitely you can use some scripts like that, right? I always tell my people, 
Uh, I like to see three or maybe four houses a day, never more than that, unless it's like an out of town buyer that's like, I'm coming in for one day. I have eight properties that I love and I'm going to make an offer on one of them. Like, all right, well, take some notes, take some pictures because all of those are going to blend together. You see more than four houses, that's hard. Like if you guys went to the Parade of Palms, you see like eight houses in a day, they're all the same house after that. Um, like I said, print out the MLS. I put key information right there. I'll circle things on it as I'm looking through it. Um, knowledgeable about the properties and neighborhood. I will do a little due diligence beforehand, right? Um, if I know they have a bunch of kids in schools and we're going to a couple of school districts, I'll look at like which ones are ranked the best if that matters to them. It's more about the house than the school district. Sometimes it's more about the school district than the house. So whatever is important, try to pull up some information there. Um, looking at comparable sales, if I think we're going to make an offer on one of these houses, I want to know, is it priced well? Because that is the first thing that they ask. If I have not done that homework beforehand, before we write an offer, I do a CMA just to make sure we're good. Um, and then I go into... It's kind of sales mode, but it's kind of like, you're going to buy this house and I'm going to find everything that we need to ask about it. So it's like all these dents, like, are you okay living with that? Because there's dents in this wall. You're going to have to fill and paint them or we're going to have to get that done beforehand. So point out any issues or concerns with the house. Um, No, what did I want? I wanted to borrow this. Your job is to actually sell homes. It's not just to show homes. Now, this is where a lot of people get confused because they think the homes will sell themselves. Um, have you guys owned homes before? Okay, just Austin. Um, how much was your first home that you bought, Austin? Have you bought anything else in your life that was even close to that amount? <laughs> it is like the biggest purchase ever so there is this element of fear and unknown like am i doing the right thing what if we just rent it forever right is is renting better than buying a house see you guys are real estate oh, agents <laughs> and you don't even know this right right now if you're you are renting it's harder to rent a property right now so here's the difference and why I think buying a house is always better. Um, it may be a little more expensive to buy a home, but the one thing that never changes is your payment. Rent typically goes up 3% every single year. Does the house payment go up every year? Principal and interest stays the same. Your taxes and insurance change. Um, so that will move up barely at all every single year, but typically you're not having big swings with a house payment. You do have to pay for fixes and that's the big thing that might change. So uh, the other thing is it's a forced savings plan. You were constantly paying down your principal. And so then if one day you wanted to go get a chunk of money, I literally did this a few years ago. I was gonna do an extension to my house. And so I refinanced my house. I did a cash out refi. I took $130,000 out of my equity and my payments stayed the same, <clears throat> stayed the same because I had a lower interest rate. So I got one hundred and thirty thousand dollars cash. I used thirty grand, paid off my solar. I had a hundred thousand dollars cash and had a lower payment than I had before. You cannot do that if you're renting. So, yes, maybe like all of the like models and things are like yeah. Renting might be better in this area. You know what? I don't buy it. You show me how I can get a hundred grand just like that for no reason. I suppose it's fix up my house. I ended up uh, investing it. I got in trouble with my wife. So you do need to sell the idea sometimes of buying or at least making an offer. I will say things like we are making a reservation on this house with our offer. You can back out. I'm going to build in contingencies. If this is not the house, we will know. So if you think this is where you could live for the next five years, which is the minimum that I put on people, 
right? From 2008 to 2013, home prices dropped and came back up to be the exact same amount. So if you will live there five years, literally our world economics uh, situation that we were in since the 1920s, it took five years from homes to go from the peak to the bottom, all the way back to where they were. And now they just shot past that. So there is an element of selling the homes. Um, showing homes means agent interaction. You should try to be the agent's favorite co-agent. No, what do we call it? Cooperating agent, yeah, co-agent. If, let's say all four of us put in an offer to Amy's listing that just went live, right? Who would she accept? if we all did the exact same offer. What does she like the most? Yep. What does she know about you three? She might know a little about Austin. I don't know if she knows you very well, Corbin. Uh, have you even met Amy? I don't even know who we're talking about. Yep. I've talked to Amy almost every day for the past month, it seems like. I'm her favorite right now by default. So if we all end up with about the same offer, she's going to pick mine. Right? Now... Could you become Amy's favorite in the course of getting an offer together? Very much so. Number one is I would not ask the stupid questions. And what I mean by that, the stupid questions are questions that are already answered on the MLS. Look at the MLS, actually read through it. Often it will say exactly what you're going to do. Because if I have a question about it, what are the chances that you guys have a question about it? So if you also have a question about it, if I'm a listing agent and I get the same answer qu twice, you know what I, or question twice, I am putting the answer in the agent remarks. That is like the first thing that I do because I am sick of answering the same question. So if you have a question, look at the agent remarks. If it is not answered there and not anywhere else that you can easily just see it on the MLS, that's where it's a phone call. And I always start by calling. Then I don't leave messages, I send texts. Is I'm okay with call, I'm okay with the text, but I don't know what they're okay with. So start with a call, then move to a text. I like a call too, because sometimes people will give you too much information as you're asking them. You know, so if it's like, oh, my clients really love the house, and they're like, oh, we have another offer. Oh, that's crazy. Okay, I want to make sure that I win. Like, tell me about like move in, move out dates. Like, like what should we structure that? What are your sellers really looking for in, in an offer? Like besides price, what would do it? Oh, by the way, where do we need to be ballpark wise with our price? They just told you all of this information. Now they're just going to tell you, oh, you know what? Be at 550 and you might win. Sweet. I'm going to write it off to 550 then. I'm going to sell that to my clients to accept all of these things that we just talked about. And I'll send you over an offer. Oh, by the way, can you... Would you be able to accept this by tomorrow at three? I'll just put that for our deadline. Like just being communicative like that. It's really nice. Um, but that might make you win offers over other people, right? Do not write an offer in DocuSign and then send it through DocuSign to the other agent. Do not forward your DocuSign email of your offer. When I write an offer, I always call the agent to let them know that the offer is coming or just came. In the email, I write why my client is awesome and why they should accept my offer and I send it off to them. There is always communication, either a call, text, or whatever to let them know that there is an email with an offer. I don't want to be that agent that went to spam and never got looked at, which has happened. And if there's multiple offers, I want to be the, the agent that has been the best at communicating. Um, as you're showing houses, you might want to have like a little home showing kit. I don't like 90% of the things in, in this, but some is helpful. Um, wipes, I would 100% bring these. You will go into some gross houses every once in a while. And if you just have like some little baby wipes or something, uh, this is a great idea. Uh, paperwork, right? We already talked about having a little kit, things like that. Um, a map, I don't think you need that. Masks, not anymore. Uh, first aid kit is probably just good to have in your car. 
shoe covers. Uh, if you're going into higher end homes, they usually will have these for you or you're going to take off your shoes. If you know that you're going to go places that has you take off your shoes the whole time, you can buy some of these pretty cheap. Uh, flashlight just for your phone. Business cards. If, if you guys have shown homes, you'll notice the agents will leave their business cards on the counter or the kitchen table. Uh, I never do this. I think it's a waste. But the whole idea here is that you are letting the sellers know, I just walked through your house. If you tend to show that house a whole bunch because you have a bunch of different buyers and they get your business cards three or four times, if that house doesn't sell, you are the first agent that they are calling because they're going to be like, you left like four business cards at my house. How come you didn't sell my house? Like, well, I'll give you the straight up answer. Uh, the level, I never brought that in my life. Umbrellas, if it's rainy, might as well throw that in. Tape measure, I actually use my phone. It's got like a measuring app. It's not exact, but it's pretty good. Uh, beverages and snacks, great idea here. Um, entertainment for kids. I, I um, One of my business expenses is paying for Disney Plus. So I have an iPad with Disney Plus if I need to just give it to children, connect to my hotspot or download a couple of like Moana movies and just let them go. Um, tissues, toilet paper, paper yeah. towels, probably a good idea. Um, don't poop in bathrooms as you're out and about. If you're ever, <laughs> if you ever need to, or if your buyers really need to go to the bathroom, make sure that the water is on before you ever use it. So like turn the sink on. Um, real embarrassing if you end up clogging a toilet in someone else's house or if your client does something like that. This card is the best. <laughs> which, yeah, <laughs> which takes me to the whole idea of safety first when showing homes. Um, first of all, never show homes to someone that you've never met. You should meet them in the office beforehand. Even if that's meet them in the office and then go or meet them at a Starbucks or whatever, I don't care. Always meet someone first before you go and show houses. Uh, this could be a safety thing. Past the safety thing, you need to buy a broker sign and you need to show your agree your your value. So you should do that, and then the rest is safety, right? If you meet someone and you get this creeper vibe, or they're like a dick to you the whole time, like you don't have to work with jerks, right? That's a that's a big rule that I have. So if you work and you're like, yeah, let me let me buy you a coffee or whatever, we'll talk and then we'll go see some houses, and they're like yelling at the barist the barista, and then you're like, you know what? I'm okay. <laughs> I don't need to be like that for you. Um, not really a safety thing, but you should tell your clients they are probably being recorded in every house that they're in. Most people have ring doorbells or something like that. Um, a lot of them will have some sort of baby monitor or camera inside their house somewhere. So definitely don't do anything that they wouldn't want the to see. And don't say anything that they wouldn't want the sellers to know, which is both like this sucks kind of a thing. And this is the house that we love. We'd be willing to pay a hundred thousand dollars more than what it's listed. Both of those conversations are probably bad to have in the home. Now, that being said, when you are trying to sell a home, you should end it in the best part and or the kitchen because that is like the gathering area and ask them, is this the house for you? Like, do you think you're going to make an offer on this? I'll often play this game like, okay, we're on house hunters. We have our three houses we're seeing. You have to tell me which one you would pick. We can give a stupid name to all of them like house hunter does. Like why? I don't even care. Like every house showing show has the same formula. You see three houses, you have to pick one. Chip and Joanna does it on fixer, fixer Uppers, the Beach House Hunters or whatever those are called. All of those are like that. Um, by the way, for the safety, you are in charge of your buyers. So if they have kids that are running around like crazy, like tell them like something breaks, like that's on me, which is then on you. So control your kids. Uh, I don't know. Safety, safety first, then team. Um, 
buyers will hesitate. They're afraid to commit. They don't like my details. They haven't seen enough. They want to sleep at it or get a trusted advisor. So they're afraid to commit. Let them know that you are going to build them certain times that they can back out of the house. So say, go sleep on this. If it still feels like it might be good, we can put in an offer and then we will have 14 days from when they accept to back out, right? And that's your due diligence, um, something like that. We're doing incremental steps. We're not jumping into you own a home. We're going to do a little baby step, right? Um, they don't like some minor detail of the home. Get a quote on that. Say, you know what? You don't like the color that you don't like that onward wall in the back. Looks like it's wallpaper. I bet we could tear it out, redo the whole wall, and it would cost us less than 500 bucks. Is that worth it to you to buy? Is everything in this house? Sometimes it's isolating details like that. Would you buy your this house if kind of a thing? Like, would you buy this house if it didn't have that crazy wallpaper? Great. Let's figure out how much it is for that wallpaper and get that negotiated in. You can do a concession that has that goes straight to a contractor that fixes something. That is a real concession. You could potentially increase your commission and pay for that. That one might be a little more difficult. Uh, you could have a home warranty that covers something like that. So if it's some minor details, ask them, if it weren't like that, would you still buy this house? Great. Why don't we overcome that, uh, that obstacle? Haven't seen enough homes. This might be a big one. You will never see enough homes. Um, is this the best of the homes that we have seen? Because the formula is both you and the buyers will find houses. You will then agree on the best houses from there and you will see those homes. So yes, we haven't seen enough houses, but how many houses have you seen online? So there's a whole pool of homes that we we said are not even good enough to see. Um, they need to sleep on it and are get the opinion of a trusted advisor. You know what? That's part of our due diligence process. You know what? And your trusted advisor better be a fiduciary for you, right? If you're helping first-time home buyers buy a condo and their trusted advisor is their dad that lives in a multi-million dollar home, do you know what it's going to be? It's not going to be good enough because he is used to a multi-million dollar home and they're seeing first-time home buyer condos. So there is a lot of the times where it won't match up. So if you can get that trusted advisor and say, look, I, I, I'm okay with you bringing in your data and everything. Remember, I am the fiduciary. I'm trying to do the best for you and put your needs ahead of everything. So let's get his opinion and remember that he might be trusted and he might be an advisor and he might say he's looking at the best, but he has a different lens on. He has his million dollar lens on where we're looking at our condo lens. We want a fixer upper. He wants a turnkey house. Like sometimes this doesn't align. And so I'm okay with this. Just know that this is it. And I won't make you make let you make a bad decision. Questions on that? Oh, what did I say? Go back to their motivation. Go back to their needs and wants. Solve them as a fiduciary. Solve their challenges. Calculate the cost of waiting. What if you didn't buy a house? My brother-in-law wanted to save 50% down before buying a house. I said, that's dumb. He said, that's what Dave Ramsey says. And I said, then Dave Ramsey is dumb. Because if you wanted to buy a $200,000 house, you need to save up $100,000. If you can't do that in one year, the average... Appreciation is 4%. That $200,000 now at $208,000. So now you have to save $104,000. So you went from having to save $100,000 to $104,000. But that appreciates again, we're adding another more than eight. So now we're at like 217. You have to save even more. Like every year it gets further and further from you. So if you don't have a plan to make $100,000 in one year, you're probably not going to save enough money. So you have to have a bigger down payment every single time, right? Right now in the real world, um, what's the cost of waiting? Of waiting. If you don't buy a house today, but you wait till like next summer, what would the cost of that be? 
Are home prices going up or down? Yeah, I think they're going up. They're at least going to stay flat. I, it's hard to think of a world where they would go down unless we have some big recession, which I, I don't think is going to happen. Um, go ahead. Interest rates going probably going down, continuing to go down. That happens. Prices might yes. accelerating faster. And yeah, if interest rates go down to 4%, they actually say if that happens, we'll probably be in a recession and home values will go down. But everyone that doesn't get affected by that recession is going to try to buy a house because interest rates are so much lower that now you're going to have a speedy frenzy on houses, which will drive prices up. By now, and then interest rates go down to 4%, you know what you do? You refinance. Easy enough. There's always a cost of waiting, right? Um, sellers. Sellers want most of their agent. They want to price the home competitively, market the home to buyers, sell within a specific time frame, fix it up, um, or other, which is like paperwork negotiation. They're kind of all over the place. They want to price it right and sell it in a specific time frame. So like the common theme that uh, people always say is I will help you sell your house for the most amount of money in the least amount of time with the least amount of headaches. That's like the real first slogan that everyone seems to come up with that solves all of this. Uh, price plus time frame plus conveyance. No, we're going to skip all these. Okay, there's only really two things that... How I would put this, there's three ingredients to sell a home. There is what price we are listed at, there's the condition of the home, and there is marketing. Those are the three ingredients. Now, marketing, that's 100% as me on me as the agent. I'm going to arm you with some information so you can do some marketing, like post on your, your neighborhood, Facebook page, things like that, share to your friends, blah, blah, blah. But my marketing plan should bring buyers and I have a track record of it working. You guys all have a track record of it working because you were going to run the same plan that I have ran for the past decade and it works, right? The secret is the MLS sells houses. 90% of the time, the way that the house is sold, it's because of the MLS. Most people find their home through their agent or online. Well, you post it on the MLS that syndicates out to every website out there. So online. So MLS is really like 75% of the way people find their home is the MLS. So we are covered there. So our marketing's good. So then the two things that we have control over is our list price and the condition of the home. The condition, do you want to paint this wall? Do you want to replace the carpet? Do you want to do all of these fixes and pay money up to get this to a better condition? If the answer is yes, we can probably go with a higher price. If the answer is no, we probably have to go to a lower price. Price and condition kind of go hand in hand with each other. Do you ever talk to them and say there's some repairs that can be done though more than increase the value of the house and more than you know the input of actually making the repairs like like paint generally, you know, the home value might go up by twice what it costs to actually Things, things yeah, like that, just cosmetic. Yeah, yeah I, I take it from the lens of sellability. Yeah, because it's real hard to come up with a number of like, oh, if you were to replace a carpet and cost you five grand, mm -hmm. do you make five grand more? Like, maybe, but like, imagine walking into a house that just is new and nice with carpet that they don't have to replace. Um, that being said, my grandpa did replace his carpet with blue carpet, so you can't go wrong on that. But so like if we do these things, our, the house will be more sellable, so we should recoup most of the cost in most of the things. Now, they could do dumb stuff that won't really help sell it, and that's where you might want to advise them and be, like have those difficult conversations, uh, but usually it will make it more sellable. Typically, you get the money out, and then if it's more sellable, then you'll get multiple offers, which will drive things up. Um, our easiest control is price, because that is literally the click of a button. So there's different ways to price the home. I call the I have a name for the three. So I call it um, multiple offers, which we're going to price at below market value and try to drive it up with multiple offers. 
There's the market value, which will do the CMA and decide what it is. And then the third is, I joke and call it California cash. So it's like, hey, what if someone from California just sold their million dollar home and is coming and will buy mine? And so they have all this money and they're willing to buy. Well, why are they going to overpay for your house and not the house down the street? Like they're not going to overpay just because they have a whole bunch of money. So California cash is more of a joke to be like, that's not how you sell homes. You don't start high and move down low um, because then you're always chasing the market down, right? And I think Courtney was talking about this the other day in her Ignite. Um, market value usually works just well and we try to find exactly what that is. Sometimes that's difficult. Below market value will always work because it will bring up multiple offers that you make bid each other up and typically you get market value or above. The only problem is if you accept the two offer uh, an offer too quickly and don't let the whole bid each other up thing happen, then you could accept an offer too low. So it's like if you're gonna if you list on Thursday and you get an offer Thursday night that says expect Friday morning, you should probably wait at least till Friday afternoon. What's up, Dean? Um, sensitive seller conversations. If you walk in a house like this, tell them that that doesn't look show ready. And that's fine. You're going to have a few conversations. I would say have them again, scale of one to 10. How honest do you want me to be with you? And let them know that you are never saying it to be mean or harsh or anything negative. It is always coming from value. You want to help them sell their home for the most amount of money. Um, again, back to the client communication. Talk to them um, throughout. And we already did this. Uh, one of the things I did want to mention is we have this equal housing opportunity, right? So you can't discriminate against people. That's why you can't put like, this is a perfect family neighborhood. When I am a buyer's agent and I send an offer I try to pull on their strings, meaning if I see family pictures all throughout the house and my buyers are a family that's moving in, I am going to mention that I have this cute little family looking to stick in the neighborhood and live there forever. And they're so excited um, because it looks like this is a family neighborhood that they can be in. I will say all of that as a buyer's agent. As the listing agent, you should not say any of that to your clients. If the buyers send you a letter and a picture of them, do not send that over to them. Um, you may have to remind people that we cannot accept offers based on like race, familiar status, what are all of the fair housing? I don't remember all of them, but all of those things. Um, if you do this, I would definitely remind them in emails. Like if they're like, we want a family to live in the neighborhood. Be like, I'm not going to mention anything about families because I can't. And put that in an email because then you're fully documenting like, hey, you'll notice that I didn't talk about if they're a family or not because we can't choose based on that. Now, can your sellers choose on that? They might, but you don't want to know if that's why they're choosing it, right? If you all three made an offer to me, you're like, we're an investor. We're a family. I'm a single dude. And my sellers wanted a family. Like, I'm like, great. I'm not going to give you that information. You'll have to choose, but they like might not choose the single dude because it's a single dude on the, on the name of the Repsy. And maybe they Googled you or something like that. And they Google you and find the family and Google you and find that you have 10 other investment properties. Like they might do their own research. I'm going to keep myself legal and not suggest that they do any of that. They should choose the best offer based on the offer, not anything else. So should we that you don't pass along any information that you get from buyers in these emails? You can just pass on the offer itself. Yep. And then you can give them any information that is not discriminatory for yeah. their result. I will often say like, uh, especially when they have like cameras or things like this. This was the offer that walked through at six o'clock yesterday. 
You know, whatever they want to do with information is up to them. But I am just making the connection. And then if I got multiple offers and I was worried about something like that, I would email them uh, with all the offers. Like, remember, we do not base our acceptance on any criteria besides the offer itself. So then we wouldn't even you just tell them, like, hey, straight up, don't even do believe people. <laughs> They they probably shouldn't, but I don't tell them that. I let them do whatever. But if they did that, I want to make sure I'm covered so I'm not in trouble. Because they could still get in trouble. They yeah, they would get in trouble. We would be left out of it. Okay. Because we would have an email that's like, we told you not to do this, but you did it all on your own, kind of a thing. So typically that doesn't happen, but uh the most common is like an investor versus a family. Like that seems like uh, like even in my neighborhood, we just had some of our friends move out and my wife said, make sure you get a family that moves in. <laughs> and I was like, well, they can't, but yes, <laughs> I would like that as well. So um, these are our value. What do we call this? A KW. The Y4 C2Ts um, kind of use this like we use this in Keller Williams. The first one is probably super big there, win, win, or no deal. And then integrity, do the right thing. Customers come first, commitment, communication, all of these things. But if it's not a win-win for your sellers and you, that's the win-win. You and whoever you represent, if it's not a win-win, then it should, probably shouldn't be done. Uh, marketing. Nope. Uh, like I mentioned, MLS is the way to sell houses. So make sure you do it right. Jeanette will help you by uploading a lot of things. You are actually on the hook if something is wrong. So double check everything. Uh, make sure you're getting professional photos. If you're going to do four floor plans, don't draw it on a piece of paper. Like actually hire someone that knows what they're doing. If you want to do videos, do videos. Like do the best that you possibly can. Um, and then set the right schedule. Uh, that just can syndicate to help. put a sign up. All right, All right. Success with co agents. We kind of talked about this a whole lot. Okay, what are your ahas? Um, just giving every detail and like what they want, so what they're looking for, whether it's price, yep. or they want like a half acre lot, um, but also setting the expectation. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's get, yeah. It's almost like get their expectations and give your expectations, right? It's all about that communication. Cause if you don't ask them, like I always tell my kids, I don't read your mind. Like, Why don't you give me a drink? I don't know. You're thirsty. <laughs> Use your words, kid. Yeah. What else? Yeah, my big one would probably be all the different ways to set expectations with regard to technology, with regard to um, any just overcoming, ways to overcome their most frequent problems. Like, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's probably the way it's going to cost them more, probably the ways it's going to um, yeah, solve the different things we're going through there. Yeah. I'm thinking about the fiduciary versus functionality where we're trying to get the win win for us and the client yeah. versus just being totally functional. Yeah. And then hopefully, whatever, like if we're buying a house or selling a house, it's a win for the, the other side as well. But that's the part that's not important. It's a win for you and a win for your client. That's a win win. Okay. Go make your phone calls. Go do some lead gen so then you can actually have some clients to work with. So make sure you're doing this, the conversations, the contacts, the notes, social media. And why leave? Oh no. So my license to be an active. Does that usually take a long time? Because like, I'm 